Good morning, everyone. Excellent. Welcome to the University of Chicago. I'm really excited to be here. Um, it's my honor to introduce Annette Gonzalez, who will be describing her commitment to action. Yo merezco. Hi, everyone. My name is Annette Gonzalez from Pontificia Universidad Católica Madre Maestra in the Dominican Republic. My 2017 CGIU commitment was the Renvision Project. It is an extracurricular mentorship program that that's ha has impacted 300 students so far. Um, the Renvision students have so far been selected for five scholarships in private schools in the Dominican Republic, and we have reached 30 volunteers so far. My partner Anna and I are currently working on a new commitment. The Yo Maresco project is um, political and social movement that aims to reduce the gender wage gap in the Dominican Republic. Currently, the pay gap in my country is roughly 30% and is worsened by the female lack of political representation. Considering the Dominican Republic has an 82% um, male government, Yo Maresco has the goal to reduce the wage gap by 10% by, before 2024, just six years from now. We're striving for the Equal Pay, pay Pact that is binding both um, private and public com companies and offices. To so accomplish our goal, we target university students and recent graduates to join a social media awareness campaign. Our movement is fueled by people. Anyone with a platform to speak is influential and can join us, and hopefully you want to join us too. Thank you. And now, please welcome our panelists. Trin Hammershoy, Managing Director, Headspace. <laughs> Hafsa Lak, Project Team Lead, Violence Against Women Centers. <laughs> Kamau Morey, Founder, XS Tennis and, Ed and Education Foundation. and Vincent Stanley, Director of Philosophy, Patagonia. Okay, all right, everyone can still hear us? Excellent. So we're gonna spend about 40 minutes uh, engaging in a bit of dialogue to learn from these amazing folks who've trekked all this way uh, to be part of this panel, um, which is about designing a meaningful project. Um, so first off, I want to start off and ask everyone a question. Um, the description of the panel sort of implies that community-driven and constituent-informed um, is, uh, is the right way to design an impactful project. So first, I want to ask everyone to uh, sort of talk a little bit about themselves, but um, tell us a little bit about who are your people. When you are designing or have designed an impactful project, who are your, the people you are trying to design that for, and why is it important to bring them into that process of design? I don't want us to go into this with the assumption that that always happens. So why don't we start with Trina and we'll work this way. Okay, hi. Um, yes, our people in Headspace Denmark, uh, it's young people between 12 and 25 years old, and uh, they are suffering from mental health issues uh, primarily, um, and, but their health, they can't get into the system to get help, but uh, they can't either maybe um, uh, go to school and so on because their mental health is, is not so good. Um, I will think it's about 20% uh, of the people between uh, 12 and 20 years in Denmark who can benefit from headspace uh, in Denmark. Thank you. Um, thank you for CGI for inviting me here and then it's always great to come back here and come back to my alma mater, New Chicago. Um, so talking about the question specifically, so I was working on designing and implementing these centers called Violence Against Women Centers, which are essentially, and I'll talk more about them in detail in a bit later, but essentially they're one-stop centers for all justice delivery departments um, under one roof. So 
all the services um, departments that you need to um, give refuge to survivors of violence, women survivors of violence, to protect them, to provide them with justice, everything under one roof. So it's police services, uh, prosecution services, uh, medical aid or medical examination, forensics, um, everything related to how to be, prosecute a crime, but then also a whole rehabilitation wing which looks at mediation for such cases and also psycho um, psychological um, um, counseling, so on and so forth as well. So talking about the design itself and why it's so important to bring your target audience um, in this specifically is, so um, see, I was working on something that it's not easy to go and, and talk to survivors of violence, asking them, hey, okay, what was your experience? I mean, we know that it's a traumatic experience for them and just bringing them up and talking about that just like relives the whole memories again and again. So for us, it was more sort of like go talk to, talk to um, civil society organizations or police officials who are actually working with them um, um, sort of help them um, um, prosecute the cases, so on and so forth. But even then, like it was integral to capture what issues they face exactly at each and every step of the, the way. The minute they go to a police um, station to register a report, um, to when they're going to prosecution offices or, or, or medical uh, facilities separately or to court and so on and so forth, like what are the steps that, that actually um, makes them hesitate to actually go and report a crime in the first place. And then even if they um, summon the courage to go and report the crime, like what issues are they facing throughout the case or process that's um, ultimately leading to such a, like, a like decreased conviction rate of such crimes. I mean, we're looking at the data, only one to 2.5% of um, the uh, crimes which are actually reported actually are like perpetrators are actually convicted. So, I mean, taking their perspective into mind, um, taking their uh, perspective into account, so on and so forth, and taking perspective of all the uh, sub 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 departments, the police department, um, the medical officers, so on and so forth, what issues they're facing while helping the victim survivors and then bringing them a justice, so on and so forth. And essentially also, um, I know I'm taking time, so just sum it up quickly, it, it really depends on where you're, or like which, in which locality or which region you're actually working on. So women or who are who's facing abuse in, in your southern part of the province or state will face very different issues as compared to women who, who, who are um, facing abuse in like a northern part of the district. I mean, the type of issues they're facing, so on and so forth. So it's very important to us to take into account all the different perspectives, um, talking to these victims too, looking into the data, um, and talking to these justice, de justice uh, services departments as well and what issues they're facing. So Kamau, who do you consider yourself your primary constituency and how have you involved them in developing your vision? Um, so um, founder of Excess Tennis and Education Foundation and uh, what we do is we provide affordable and a lot of times free tennis lessons to inner city youth uh, as a way to putting them on a path to ultimately achieve a college scholarship. Um, and so the people we involve really from identifying the problem and the issues are kids from the south, south and west sides uh, who, you know, A, the parents have no college fund. B, the kids have, don't have a lot of skills that can translate into a college scholarship. Um, and I just sort of used myself as a test case. When I grew up on the South Side, about a mile away from here, I had you know, seven best friends, and I was the only one to graduate college. The other six all went to college. Perhaps they finished year one, but couldn't afford to go back year two. Loans didn't get renewed, whatever it was. Some people you know, finished year two, had to take off a year to go work to pay for year three, never went back. And so I myself identified the problem of if you don't have a four-year opportunity to obtain this education, it is too hard to do it in pieces. And so, you know, my only, the only thing I was, I wasn't a great student. I would have never gotten to U Chicago. So the only contribution I could have made to my community was to teach people how to play tennis because I got a full tennis scholarship to college. Uh, while in college, I found out about um, uh, Title IX, which states that, you know, for every boy scholarship, you got to find a girl scholarship. And tennis is one of the sports where they give double the amount of scholarships to women versus men. And so I said, wow, there's an opportunity for every single girl in the city of Chicago to go to college playing tennis because last year, 992 girls' tennis scholarships went unawarded. And so we are primarily focused on solving that. So our organization serves 72% girls because if you can spell tennis correctly, forwards and backwards, you can get a scholarship, right? And so 100% of our kids have gotten college scholarships, 100% of them have graduated, uh, and these are good schools. Uh, and so we involve the community just identify the challenges, whether it be transportation, whether it be cost, whether it be parental involvement, whether it be, um, you know, obesity, whether it be equipment. We identify those. 
but as it relates to designing a project, we just built a facility about a mile away from here. I actually didn't involve anybody from the community. Uh, this is only the third tennis, indoor tennis facility in the country to be built in the low income census tract area. So there isn't a lot of people who know a lot about this space. And so I actually in interacted with a lot with people from across the globe. Martina Navratilova came here about eight times to look at the site. How would I lay out this place? Billie Jean King, um, a lot of people from Asia. And so I leaned on the global influence of tennis to say, how is the Czech Republic have 10 people in the top 20 in the world in women's tennis, right? All these people were all impoverished. So what are you all doing that we can do in the south, in the south side of Chicago? And so, you know, in terms of identifying the problems, I work with local community, but in terms of designing the project, I didn't involve any of them, unfortunately. Well, no, I, and I think that that's the reason why I wanted to tease this out, that when we have sort of this sort of utopia version of involving constituents and community in designing a project, it's only right to make sure where is their time and energy and insight going to be the most valuable to create the right program, and where is expertise of a nature that you might have a broader sense of constituency or folks you draw on. And that's a probably good segue to you, Vincent, because uh, Patagonia, I love your title, by the way. And so can you tell us a little bit about who do you think your people are? How are you engaging them in sort of the vision of Patagonia? Um, I, ha I have several tribes right now, and, and, and one of them are, are the Patagonia employees themselves, because I've been at the company. I started with the company in 1973, when uh, the same year we started Patagonia, it was about 10 people, sales of about $200,000 a year. And I've been with the company as it morphed from this climbing equipment and outdoor uh, clothing company into an environmental activist company and uh, into an influence in the apparel industry. So one of, the, one of the concerns I have at work is this sort of principle of subsidiarity that anybody who's going to be affected by a decision should be consulted. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a consensus process. It just means that it's very difficult for people to own a decision in any way if they're coming in after it's made. The, my second tribe right now is uh, I work at Yale um, a great deal with uh, joint students between the environmental and the business programs. And they're really going out into the world. They're trying to figure out, much as all of you are, uh, what kind of initiative they want to be engaged in and what they want to do with their working lives. And I, I, I thought your point was really interesting about looking, talking to the people in global tennis, talking to the people in the Czech Republic about uh, getting advice for what you need to do in South Chicago. Because for the many problems that globalism presents in our time, the great advantage is that you can connect with people around the world who are doing things that may be of benefit to the project you want to engage in. So, Trine, let me, let me turn back to you. Um, when we were talking a little bit before, you were talking about how when you had this small idea to have a, a meaningful, impactful project, it was well loved. And when you started to scale and actually had government resources starting to flow, some of that love went away. Can you talk a little bit about when you scale a project, how that changes your constituents or how it changes how people perceive your project? Yes, actually we started in 2013 and we had six centers of headspace centers uh, in, in Denmark. Now we have 19 and the government has just told that they like to make us nationwide. And you know, when we started back then in 2013, there was this uh, about we were come, uh, new, one, new ones. Uh, they really liked us. Um, other organizations liked the Headspace idea. It hasn't been seen in Denmark before because we are co uh, cooperating between uh, you know, a lot of volunteers and uh, paid workers and uh, people from the municipalities. It, ha it hasn't been seen in Denmark before, so yeah. We were a success, right? Animated who's sitting there. And um, now I think you all have to you be aware of the fact that when you have this sm small idea or your great ideas uh, and you are coming out of them and yeah, people love them, you also have to be aware that you will get to a point where you will grow bigger. And some, some 
people might not think that you are the one who should have the money. And as I think it was Mr. President Clinton uh, once said, it's all about economic stupid. I don't know if you remember that line, but it is about economic. And I think all of you know that uh, who are sitting here, that when you will have a project, you will also have to fight for the money. And it's about money and power. And there, I'm, I'm so sorry to say there will be people out there who doesn't think your idea is such a great thing that you, you do. But I think we in Headspace Denmark, we try to stick to our idea to make sense for young people. What makes sense for young people in, uh, makes sense for Headspace Denmark. And we will fight for it, but yeah, you have, to, you have to stick to the idea, although there will be people who will not love your idea so much as they maybe did two years ago. I appreciate you introducing the concept of power. From my community organizing background, they teach you a very simple definition of power, which is organized people and organized money. And it's important to build both types of power to back an idea. Um, and the constituency to have those allies is going to be important. Um, uh, Afsa, can you talk as well? You had to, you've scaled as well. Um, and you were sort of nodding in agreement with Trine. What resonates with that? And what advice would you give to folks when you have an idea and you're scaling it and you meet opposition? Uh, or challenges to kind of take a small idea and scale it to meet the demand? So the reason I was nodding also is because I'm, I think I'm having the opposite issue. My project was actually government funded. And so where it resonated was essentially when we, so the way my unit operated back then, strategic reforms, you know, essentially we it was part of the chief executive's office of the province. So the way unit operated was we designed an idea, as we come, came up with the concept, made it more comprehensive, taking into um, all stakeholders, so on and so forth, got the idea approved by the chief executive, and then implemented with the, with the help of all the relevant government departments, and then got it funded by um, the government as well. So initially, there was opposition more from the bureaucracy as well, like because it's a completely new, different. You basically, you're you having all these departments sit under one roof. That's never happened before in in my country. I mean, there are there may be like my examples where you have these one-stop crisis centers and hospitals. I mean, in other countries, that is in Bangladesh, Malaysia, so on and so forth, but never in in, in Pakistan. So the idea that police will have to um, like, listen to the prosecutors and in telling them how to like make a police report, um, which uh, legal sections to put in like, to make it accurate and make it like, more substantial. That was the thing that we had um, um, to deal with specifically. So there was resistance in the bureaucracy and the way we went about it, we made allies, friends in each and every other department who then helped us lobby our cause within like, the higher ups in the department as well and like, just like helping them um, come on board and like, um, for the project. And then, but then there was opposition from the religious sector as well. It was like, hey, you're, you're giving all these powers to women. I mean, what, you're putting men in jail, what, so on and so forth. So especially also because to give a legal cover to these centers, we passed this legislation called Punjab Protection Women Against Violence Act. And what it essentially did was it had um, protection orders, which are like restraining orders here, but the way we were enforcing it was basically saying that we'll um, use electronic GPS braces to track one of the perpetrators and make sure that they don't come near, near the victim. That was like a huge thing, like, oh, you, you're making men wear these bracelets where you're evicting them from their ha own houses. You, you're increasing divorce rate. Um, um, in, 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 in the society, so on and so forth. But so, and, and so again, like focus group, getting friends on our side from the religious sector and then using, taking their help to sort of getting every other opposition from the religious sector as well. Um, but essentially, um, so coming back to upscaling, so on and so forth as well. So what we, the way we um, went about this idea was essentially to have a pilot um, in, in a pilot center one um, in an area which had the most violence against women crimes that we knew of, like looking at the data, so on and so forth, and then like upscaling. Um, and like the reason also we wanted to start with a pilot was because we knew that there were going to be so many issues, because um, since it's the first time, to, like how to make sure that these departments actually talk to each other, um, um, and like how to like streamline the SOPs, so on and so forth as well. Um, but in, in the issue that we're facing now is essentially that 
this was a project of the previous administration, right? And then once we got the administration on our side, they made like extremely streamlined funds. Hey, you have these funds for the next three, four years too. This is such a great idea. You and women, all these international organizations are on our side. They're saying, hey, this is like a pilot. This is like actually like a blueprint for other organizations to actually implement and, and effectively address GBV crimes. Not only like give women justice, but also give them psychosociological support. Um, God, that's have the civil society on board, have the media on board, so on and so forth, and then the government changes hands. So uh, this project is now looked as a pet project of the previous administration. So now we're having this whole struggle of um, like how to put pressure on the current administration to make sure that this project, like given, so we, we implemented the pilot back in March 2017. Since then, we've, um, given aid, like given services to more than 2,100 survivors of violence, and we've successfully resolved more than 1,800 of the cases, mm. and the rest are pending in, in court at this point. I mean, I still remember the, f the f day we inaugurated the, sesh uh, the center, uh, a, a, a survivor walked in bare feet with a five, four or five-year-old kid on her side saying, hey, um, I just heard that there's a center which is opening and, and they, they can help women mm -hmm. like me. Can you help me, right? Mm. And then so since then, we've received women for all kinds of services, from for psychological violence, for custody of their children, to help them in economic abuse cases, I mean, in like human trafficking cases, so on and so forth. And so now the struggle is to um, have, so, and the surprising that all we have all the civil society and media and everyone else on board, and they're like helping us put pressure on the current administration how to make sure that this, uh, <clears throat> the pilot center continues to running, it receives the funding, it was supposed to receive mm -hmm. and then like upscale it because we have plans for mm -hmm. four or five other centers to like implement in a phased wise approach. Thank but, you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Kamau, uh, talking about scale, you started with four students who've successfully uh, achieved the vision you had for them. Um, can you talk about um, what it's meant to come from the south side, um, have a vision, implement that vision and, and scale? How has the community responded? How have folks been excited for you and supported, or what challenges have you had to actually come from the community that you've accomplished such an amazing vision that actually goes from local to global? Um, so I think that you know Chicago is um, very incestuous, and so I think you know being a middle class kid, middle child, um, is being very average in every sense of the word as a child. Um, when I started this, I didn't have any capital, didn't have any network, didn't have any relationships. And so I think it was important to build that. But what I did have is sort of credentials, right? I had, as a child and as an individual, I did everything I should have done. Graduated, you know, good grades, got a degree, never any trouble, made kids out of wedlock, all this other kind of crazy stuff, right? Um, and so I think that it was, once I started to A, build a network, um, then I started to build relationships, and after that, I built capital. And so I think it was easy for the city to get behind that, just because I think um, a lot of projects in the city are done from people outside the community and not well received. And so unfortunately, like this is not a positive thing, but unfortunately, I was one of the few people who were from the community they were trying to serve uh, and had sort of everything in order and worth supporting. Um, so that would be my advice to everybody, is just sort of make sure everything's in order. Um, and then, you know, the people inside the community, I think, um, you know, initially were very skeptic, skeptic, you know, just very skeptic. I think that, you know, from a community like the south and west sides of Chicago, we are so used to being disappointed. You know, I can name 10 things that were supposed to come to the south side and never came, you know, south and west side. So I think it was hard for people to get excited about it. And so instead of supporting it and running the risk of being disappointed, everyone just sort of rolled the fence. Right, and as we got to the finish line, everybody started to get excited, right, and or jealous. But I think, you know, one of the things I constantly try to teach to my students and my staff is that, you know, plan for success. Don't plan for it to be easy, but plan to eventually get to the finish line. Um, because if you don't go into it with enthusiasm, right, and with sort of a dogmatic attitude, you won't get to the finish line anyway. And so I think that the community was very cautious about their excitement and about their support for the project. At, you know, because they were afraid to once again be disappointed, right? And so uh, I don't think I received the support within the community that I thought I would because of that fact. But outside the community, when you bring, 
you know, different types of layers into the project, right? You gotta bring people here who you're trying to serve to identify the issues they face. Then you have to bring people in who are uh, not as stressed, very creative, um, and used to having things go right, mm -hmm. and who get into organizations and get into projects with, I have the network, the resources, the capital, and the attitude that if I'm involved, it's gonna work. Mm -hmm. And I think once you kind of combine those and you sort of meet in the middle, mm -hmm. right? And so I think, um, you know, that was sort of my experience. No, that's actually an excellent um, piece of advice sort of wrapped in there, which is sort of a leader really has to sort of organize from the bottom up and the top down and kind of pull those pieces together. Um, Vincent, that sort of ties into something that um, I really would love to hear you talk about. When you think about planning for success, um, you're not gonna be there forever. Um, what values are important to bake into a project at the front end so it's not just about the charismatic individual um, the unique individual who got something done, um, but is really institutionalized, so it's not just an impactful project, but it's an impactful set of values that can endure beyond one leader. Yeah. Um, uh, this has been a, a, a really strong interest of mine, and I think it's because in the early days uh, of, of Patagonia, we really didn't know what we wanted to be when we grew up and we didn't know what kind of company we wanted to create, and we nearly lost it in the late 80s and early 90s by uh, growing in several directions. And then the owners and some of the other people who had been with the company saying, is this the kind of place we want to come to work for every morning? Or are we just creating some kind of conventional company that needs to be sold and pawned off to someone else? But I, I really think, and when I when I look around me, almost any organization or institution or community has its own personality. It has its own um, uh, characteristics. So, and, and, and I think it's important for the leadership to understand what those distinguishing characteristics are and what the fundamental values of the people starting the initiative are. And to make sure you don't stray from that. Um, and I think it very much helps to have things written down, just a simple mission or vision statement. It very much helps that all of your communication to your stakeholders, to people who are investing in your initiative, to your employees, to the people who are benefiting from your services or product, that you communicate in the same way to everyone so the, the expectations are solid, that these values are real. Can you give an example of one like concrete value? Like, yeah. what, is the, what does that translate into, and how does that translate into how you communicate with different folks? Well, f you know, for, for us, an example is we made a, a commitment in, uh, in the early 90s when we discovered uh, the, the intensive use of very bad chemicals in uh, growing cotton, we made a commitment to going organic. Um, and this was a very difficult decision. But I think that the fact that the company had always articulated that we cared about the environment because we were originally a band of climbers and surfers and that we cared about the environment not just to protect wild places but also to start to look at our own behavior in the supply chain mm -hmm. to places that we didn't own to factories that we didn't own to dye houses that were polluting rivers <sighs> that were thousands of miles from where we were so that commitment that environmental commitment actually got us through a really difficult patch when we broke our connection to the supply chain and bought organic cotton from farmers who had no relationships or no connection, no network with spinners and, and weavers and, and, and knitters down the line. So that's, that's one example. If we hadn't had that connection, I think our people inside would have given up because it would have been too difficult a project. Well, could I mm -hmm. yeah, please. Uh, join in? Because I think you're right. You have to write things down, but you also have to uh, be aware of um, that you have your team, the, the, right, uh, the right people. It's crucial for you to have uh, the right people on your team. Um, I think we experienced in uh, Headspace Denmark, we had a few, uh, a few of us has been, yeah, within the last five years. Uh, or 10 years, uh, but uh, working at Headspace in five years, and we are very stick to yeah the, the values, the core values, but we also, um, what can you say, attract 
uh, people who like to be part of the success. And they are very smart people, actually, uh, when you meet them and we like them, but they have their own agenda. So I can just give, if I could give you uh, one advice, it should also be that you are very, what, are, what is it called in English? Well, you, you, you have to be very, um, when you pick people out at your team, they should stick to the core values. You have to be aware of that, not you know, people who have their own agendas, who like to join in at your team because you're a success. Yeah, and, I, and I think any organization has people, who, some people who are uh, careerists and some people who are sort of people of the cloth. Um, but in order to keep the organization on its mission, you have to have uh, more people yeah. who are really aligned with your mission. And, and, and then the more you do, th this is a circle. So if, 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 you're, if you do what you say you do, that feeds back and makes what you say more authentic and more, more real. So 25 years ago, when we came up with our mission statement, you know, build the best product, cause no unnecessary harm, use business to inspire and implement solutions to the environmental crisis, I was opposed to that. I, thought, I hated mission statements. I thought, <laughs> you know, they're all nonsense. I want to strive to do this or foster this. It's all, how do you want to appear? But we actually, I think now, 27 years later, are, are starting to inhabit that language and are starting to realize that language, partly because we've driven so much of our behavior to support it. And it goes in a circle like that. I'm going to um, ask a, a little tough question before we wind down with our last 10 minutes. Um, you're all very successful. We usually have panels of people who are successful. And yet, um, you don't get to be successful without having taken risks that have actually not worked out. So just FYI. Um, and so I'd love everyone to sort of talk about, because um, it's also about action, right? So if you're going to take action, something's going to happen. Um, can you all give an example of an action you took that either didn't quite go the way you thought it would or had an unintended consequence that really messed up the game plan. And I'm going to start local with Chicago. Because <laughs> Chicagoans, we never make mistakes. <laughs> um, so I think that uh, as sort of our organization grew and the story got out there and the success grew, a lot of people wanted to get involved. And I think from early on, not having a lot of support, you know, you became, you know, come one, come all, right? Everyone wants to come support. We need all the help we can get, that kind of thing. And so we had, um, quote unquote, volunteers that we brought into the project that end up, you know, wanting to get paid when it was not part of the agreement, right? And we had a lot of people involved in the project that I think their, their intent was not there. And so, um, you know, I know we, we have to have like, you know, a lot of resources and a lot of people to make good things happen, but I think I would, I would just caution to be very careful and just make sure that there's like three things that I sort of pay attention to and it's um, energy, effort, and intent, right? And so I think I need a lot of skilled people at different types, parts of this project, but some of the energy was bad. Uh, the effort was mostly always there, but the intent was always bad, right? And so I think that, um, you know, I can name two or three individuals which, we won't have, right now. Right. <laughs> uh, but if I had to, like, you know, if I didn't have a reputation to uphold, if I saw him on the street, it'd be a problem. Uh, but it's just, you know, you just, you know, I think just not being cautious enough yeah. with people and support yeah. if when you start to build momentum, right? Um, and that was probably, and it actually made it very difficult and sort of took some of the energy out of the wind out of my sails, yeah. right? Because then it's hard to, once you let them in the project, it's hard to get them out. Right, because then they become exposed to all the inner workings and that kind of thing. So um, that would be my advice. That was very helpful. I want to go this way. Really? Okay. Yes. Um, well, I can tell about, um, I think it was 2016, where we was uh, primarily funded, private funded at the beginning. Um, and then the private funds said to us, well, you have to make, uh, to get more money, you have to uh, make Headspace all volunteer. We have a lot of volunteers, but also paid, paid uh, staff. And um, we sat there, and we discussed it, and we thought, OK, we have been yeah, named uh, best practice in, in the Nordic countries. And well, we really have to try to stick to our model. And we, we thought it was such a great idea. So uh, we turned the private funds down. 
and said to them, no, we will not go the, uh, the way you suggested. Uh, we will rather die <laughs> or, uh, yeah. But uh, then we said to the government, you have to uh, help us um, because now we have proven that uh, Headspace is uh, a, a quite a new model who works for a lot of young people. But um, if, you, you, if you don't uh, supply us, we will have to close. And that was, yeah, quite an, you, I can, yeah, quite a, a situation for us, but it worked, so. Right risk. Hafsa? Yeah, thank you. I think there were a number of things, um, but the key was to just um, keep persisting and just like find out ways to how to go around it. But essentially, like talking about the design itself and the project design, um, we were just like a team of four or five people in the beginning. So like it was everything, like um, getting people on board, like coming up with the project, coming up with implementations and everything. And then in that confusion, I think, not the confusion, but like, get, like being like, um, having less people and like so less resources to work with. We, um, for example, so you, when you're working with the government, you everything has to be detailed and everything has to be ordered beforehand, for example, like all everything. So like even the fact that how many furniture chairs are you going to be needing in your center? Yeah. How many tables? Like what amount should be for stationary? I mean, so that budget has to be made like way months in advance and then based on that, you get your funds so on and so forth. I mean, so because this was like, this was like a, our first thing, like a first experience with designing a center as well. Um, and we're still learning. So a lot of things, that logistical issues we faced when the center was launched. I mean, things like, well, we couldn't, they, we didn't anticipate at that time. Like, for example, in the waiter cool, in the waiting area, I mean, it's summers, it's like 110 degrees, 120 degrees outside. You need to have like a water cooler there as well. Right, so things like those, um, logistic issues, but then, like I think one other thing which was out of our hands, but it just still had like a significant impact was, like again, I think my perspectives are coming more with well, from working with the government, especially like a South Asian government. Um, so things like, even though you're doing all the work, you need to really bring on board the department, the relevant government department. So on the inauguration ceremony, the launch ceremony, we're handing out these shields to all the people who worked really hard, and we were like, no, we're only gonna, um, um, acknowledge those people who who are like at the director level, not at the top level, but like the mid executives who really helped us and honor them. Mm -hmm. We didn't um, honor the person who was right at the top, and because we didn't, he really created issues when mm -hmm. we were actually implementing the project. So things like that, and like be relations also for that you really need to keep in mind. Um, uh, that's a very important lesson across the board. Always acknowledge everyone. It's the cheapest way you can save yourself. Yeah. <laughs> um, Vincent, um, we've had a, we've we've had a lot of them. One of the earliest disasters was we we uh, decided to uh, for every shirt and pants, any place we used a button, we we sourced this button from the Tagua nut that came from the Brazilian rainforest, which we thought was this wonderful idea. It was a beautiful button. It came out. We shipped out everything, all of the shirts for the season. And then they started to come back because they cracked in the dryer, <laughs> and we hadn't we hadn't researched it. But a, another sort of more meaningful one, I remember. I, I think people should beware of the of the current uh, craze for KPIs or key performance indicators versus looking at the holistic health of your initiative, because they can be the the, the human capacity for gaming the system is so outstanding that once you start to create um, these uh, KPIs, they become uh, aims in themselves. I can give you an example from when there was a time, 25 years ago, I was sales manager, and I decided to create a very elaborate uh, incentive system for my reps, which was how many clinics they gave the employees, was based on sales, was based on this and based on that. Incredibly difficult to monitor. And I remember one year, one of our reps aced it. He got 100% on this very elaborate system. And I said, congratulations, Mike. And he said, I just did the job I always do. And that kind of came home to me, that in terms of human motivation, in terms of motivation of organizations, when we, when we start to get fancy, um, it's often uh, a distraction uh, rather than uh, a help. 
I heard a lot of hmms. Um, so University of Chicago, known for sort of data. Uh, so one of the things I'd like to wrap up, we only have a few, uh, a few seconds, but this last point, um, there's a lot of push for evidence, a lot of push for data. Um, how, how, how do you focus on innovation? Because I, I like to remind people innovation is not evidence-based. Um, you're usually the trailblazer. If there was like, in one minute, uh, what's, like, what's next on the horizon for each of you? What are you trying to change next? I'll go Vincent and then this way. I think for us, the big discovery of the past 15 years is that the constraints that we create for ourselves, both environmentally and socially, because we're now working uh, about half of our products are made with fair trade certified labor, that those constraints actually drive innovation if you let them, if you, uh, if you organize your work around that. So that, that, would, be the, that would be my quick answer. And constraints drive innovation. Come out. Yep. Um, so I would say in, in uh, tennis, which is a simple thing, tennis changes every six months. Athletes get bigger. The balls change. The racket technology changes. That's number one. But you know, the most important part of what we do at the organization is the education piece, and I think that that changes even faster. And so, um, you know, how are we keeping up? What kind of new programs? What kind of new partners? What kind of new technology can we bring and expose the kids to? Um, because as they become better in tennis, it's actually the reverse happens. Like a lot of times, the better football player you are, you're going to go to Michigan, right? And you can get in Michigan with a 22 and an ACT, right, if you play football. Where the better tennis player you are, you want to go to Stanford, or you want to go to Princeton, you want to go to Yale, you want to go to those. So I think it's sort of the reverse, where the highest, uh, strongest yeah. tennis programs are also the strongest academic schools. Yeah. And so we've seen a lot of kids in our program be top 20 in the country, top 100 in the world, and not be able to go to Stanford because yeah. they got 22 in the ACT. And as an organization, yeah. we didn't prepare for that. You know, early on, it was like, okay, hey, top 10 in the country, you want to go to Michigan. Great, right? Well, it's like, no, you should go to Stanford or Yale or Chicago, whatever. So um, I think that we're constantly trying to keep up with the education technology uh, and then sort of the social challenges around confidence and bullying and all the other things that affect the student's self-esteem. Because one of the things about tennis is you're out there on, ten on tennis court by yourself. So you don't have anyone to support you. Like I call it the loneliest place on earth, mm -hmm. especially when you're overseas somewhere, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and you want to find like the nearest chair to hide under. Mm -hmm. And so I think that a kid who is being bullied or has low self-esteem in the classroom or in the school environment will never achieve what they can on a tennis court. And so we are having a hard time keeping up with cyberbullying, right? Uh, and so as an organization, as we also provide the mentoring and all that kind of stuff, you know, we're trying to constantly stay up to date and change and bring on new partners to address those things. Thank you. Very quickly. So before the administration changed, Han, it's mostly uh, because of such a new thing, how to constantly evolve our processes to make sure that the departments in like with sitting under, even the sitting under one roof, like how to make sure they're talking to each other, the case for process is streamlined, the type of cases that we're receiving, like how to deal with psychological ones, how to deal with economic abuse, how to make sure that the, whatever remedies we guaranteed under the legislation we passed are actually being um, provided to them. And like if you, and if their lack of resources, there's not enough funding available, like how to involve um, a pool of volunteer um, legal officers who can actually take up cases of the victim survivors and then take them to court and help them. So it's like constantly involving, and then if you're upscaling, um, obviously like a different state where would have like a different type of violences that are occurring there. How to make sure, how to um, structure. So our first building was custom built for this particular um, um, district, regional uh, region. How to like customize the customized building to a different region. But now um, it's more like, so for the past two, three months, these, the staff members haven't been paid because of um, the administration's own support, the political thing is going on. Like, how to um, keep their motivation and uh, like motivation up so that they can actually continue working, or some sort of other resources um, to make sure that the center is up and running. Thank you, and Trine, last word. Yes, we will uh, we will be expanding, uh, maybe also to Greenland, if you know Greenland, uh, and uh, we will need further documentation. We will have our focus on documentation, documentation, documentation. Figures, figures, figures. All right, well, I'd like to thank all of our panelists. Thank you very much for sharing your lessons. Uh, so raise your hand up high, don't be shy. We can probably do three or four, so really raise your hand up high if you want some ice attention. Okay, one.
Name, give us your name, where you're from, and ask a question. My name is Cassidy Grady. I'm from the Colorado School of Mines. Um, and I was wondering, how do you engage those um, who oppose you, who mm. maybe, or also maybe show support for you, but haven't made that next step to um, actually commit to your project or commit to supporting you? And I'm going to have everyone just take one question so we can get to a few questions. So would someone like to answer that one? How do you engage people who oppose you? That happens sometimes. Anyone, anyone? I'm looking at Kamal because I imagine. Oh, wait. All right, Trine. Got it. Yeah, well, we try to talk to them, but uh, <laughs> eventually it is not always a, a success. But, um, well, you, you need to engage people around you who believe in you and have them to speak up for you. You know, in our case, it's politicians, uh, uh, young people who have experiences from Headspace where uh, yeah, they have been supported. Um, but um, you also have to... Uh, make the documentation so you can prove to them you're wrong, mm -hmm. what you are saying, it's out of context, it's, they've picked something out of context. So you need, as I said before, the documentation, but you also need the, your own ambassadors to stand up for you, and then you just have to maybe okay. uh, put something in your ears and stick to your idea. Since this is going to happen to everyone in this room at least once, I'm going to have one more response. Kamal? So I would um, say to ask why. So those that oppose you, I think it's important that you know, you know, sort of what's out there. You know, so I have like a lot of people in the community who say, hey, I heard this, hey, I heard that. And I just make a note of it, you know, to try to ultimately make yourself bulletproof. And I remember one time I had a donor that I thought was going to write me a $5 million check and wrote me a $200,000 check and wrote somebody else a $5 million check. And I had to say, why did they get five and I got 200,000? And just say, you know, what is the hesitancy? What do they have that I didn't have? What data do they have that I don't have? What credentials, what is it? What do you not understand? Their idea was very basic. And so sometimes when, you know, you have creative people in the room and your idea is creative and very thoughtful and gonna move the world forward, people who are just focused on today don't understand it. And so that discomfort allows them to tread lightly. And so I think that the biggest, the best thing you can do is just, just be bold and ask why. Not be ungrateful and say, hey, you gave them five million, you gave me 200 grand. I'm trying to raise 17 million, this doesn't move the needle. But you just say, why? Oh, how can I make you feel more comfortable? Because as you were writing this check, your hand was shaking, right? And so I would just be bold and be respectful and just ask why so you can know what's out there that you can address. Definitely, and the key point is engage them because they won't go away if you don't. Um, raise your hand really high. Samaya, who are you gonna pick? Second oh, we have Kelly. another person with a mic. Okay. Yeah. I just don't know your name. Oh, Kelly. Hi, Kelly. Hi. All right. Come on. Get one. Get one. Again, give us your name and where you're from and your question. Um, hi, my name is Christine, and I'm from Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. Um, my question is, how did you create a business plan, basically, for your projects? I'm going to say, Vincent, you want to take a step or uh, a soft? Business plan, anyone created a business plan? <laughs> Mine would be more like a, so it was more like a feasibility report that we created for the government as opposed to like a business plan. But then again, so it was basically like, so our whole project design included like a three tier um, research which included data, talking to multi-stakeholders -sta from every department, so on and so forth. And that data was the basis of everything that we did from their point onwards, making reports, making business studies or like feasibility reports, so on and so forth. And then feasibility, and like, so initially you have, you put down your own thoughts that we had, like our whole team had, like this is how we're envisioning the project to be, this is how we're envisioning what logistical requirements are we gonna need, how much human resource we're gonna need, how much budget, like, and, to, like, and for us, we had to like detail to each and everything, how much would a furniture chair would cost, right, so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, and then you take it to the relevant government or the friends or allies that you've made in each in department or the stakeholders to get their ideas and opinions and how we think we can further improve upon it, so on and so forth. For us, it was very important to go with an open mind in the sense because we knew that we were still learning. Um, at this process. I mean, we know what the issues are, we've done our research, and we've we've seen on ground, the impact on ground, and we've seen what the issues are on ground. However, we still, we went with the thinking that we, we're still learning, and we, these are the experts in their fields, so let's just get their opinion and thoughts on how we should go about it. And then, buddy, well, to take that to a, with like a pinch of salt as well, okay? You, you incorporate the things that you think mm -hmm. will make sense, and then, you just like respectfully not can copy the things that you think won't make sense. But essentially, 
um, for us, the major thing was getting in touch with all these stakeholders and experts in the respective fields and seeing what their thoughts are on our initial business proposal, the feasibility proposal. I think that's a great point. You might be a social entrepreneur and you think you're putting in your business plan with your great idea, but to get the buy-in and the feedback and know which buy-in to sort of incorporate and which to take but respectfully not incorporate, it's still your vision, I think is a great point. Uh, another question, another question. Samaya has got... Hello. Hello. My name is Kimberly Gardner and I'm from Howard University. And my question is, to those who much is given, much is required, have you ever felt overwhelmed in your journey or in wavering and trusting the process? Yes. <laughs> I, I, ha I have to respond because I love that quote. I had a mentor tell me that exact same thing in college. Besides my simple answer, would anyone else like to add? Yes. <laughs> well, I would like to, in, yeah. Well, there had been moments in this process where I have cried uh, and I f thought, okay, maybe it's not worth it. Um, but you know, when you have a great idea and you know a lot of people benefit from it, well, then you know you have to stick onto it and you have to believe and you have to believe in your, your team who is supporting you. Um, and you have to have this goal and when you have this goal in front of you, you always uh, know that, well, it is uh, worth it. Just, just, a, oh, I'm sorry. just a quick thing, which is um, Kamal had made the comment that you, it, when, when you're down in the dumps, find people who aren't as close to mm. the issue as you are, mm. who also know something about it. And that can often be a, a great source of energy. So yeah, absolutely. Um, so I mean, as I said, I think I alluded to this before as well, you're working with the bureaucracy. I mean, they have, with all due respect, like their own version on how the things should be, and it's mostly the status quo, and you're going with this like, completely different radical idea. Um, yeah, at every set of, a step of the way, um, we're dealing with the bureaucracy, dealing with the legislatures when we were passing the legislation. I mean, my colleague Salman Zubi was actually head of a unit. Like, we spent months negotiating with them on how the legislation should be, like what amendments to incorporate and what not to incorporate, so on and so forth. Um, and then additionally, when we're actually implementing the center, like every logistical roadblock, you do. But then, as, 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 as my friend here mentioned, you look at, you, you think about why you were doing this in the first place, okay? Why I was even working at the government and like working on this project. And then you think about that, and then I think about the fact like, I think when we were designing the concept it was back in 2014, and then we were coming across these reports of how survivors were, because they, their case wasn't being um, administered, by, administered by the police, just to get their attention, they were dousing themselves with petrol or gas and then trying to set themselves on fire in front of press clubs just to get their attention, to get this media hype so that police officers would take them seriously. And then you think about those things, you think about how far we've come. I mean, it's been a few years now. We've, we've helped more than 2,100 survivors. Um, we, we try to upscale it, but there are a lot of international organizations which are interested in this and how to implement the same model in their respective countries to effectively address GBV. You think about those things and you're like, no, okay, like, like this is like our, like, do we, this do you have, if not us, like who else is going to take this up? Come out with last line. I actually had a stroke at 31, mm -hmm. trying to do what I was doing. So I think that um, I was in Dothan, Alabama, and it was a week before the CHA vote where they were going to release the 23 acres of land I needed to do my project. Our Chicago and Housing Authority. Chicago Housing Authority. Um, and it was the first time in 22 years that they had actually sold land to somebody instead of leasing it to them. And so I was in Dalton, Alabama with a girl, one of my first five girls, who was number one in the world at the time. And so we were there trying to kind of transition her from a number one junior in the world to the pro tour. And so I was trying to balance supporting her. She's from Inglewood, no money, no resources, living with me, feet and her ups, feet and everything. Uh, so trying to balance her career, also you know, trying to finish this off. And then by that time, I had engaged so many important people in the city but I think that you got to keep going, right? So it's kind of like, you know, 50 Cent was my favorite rapper back in the day. And he said, get rich or die trying. But I think my project, it came to a point where there were so many important people involved that you cannot let them down. Otherwise, you have to leave Chicago. And so I was so stressed and making sure that this happened and it went well that I had a stroke, literally, driving. So 
you know, your idea is going to be abstract, and you're going to have to get a lot of people to believe in it. And if you really want it to happen, you got to, like, go. Take care of yourself along the way. Yeah. We have time for one more question, and I think this is the hard job of the moderator. Oh, it's Thanks. so easy. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> Last question. And my question is for Hafsa. My name is Bisola. <clears throat> And I'm from Kentucky State University. So in um, dealing with a government that doesn't prioritize your idea, how do you cozy up to them well enough to make them do what you want them to do? Mm. And secondly, how do you, what are the benefits or detriments of involving international um, um, governmental organizations? So for instance, the African Union or um, the UN in making, mm -hmm. in coaxing, that particular government to do whatever it is? Do you think it will work? Do you think it will scare them away? How do you find that balance? I'm going to, just in this way, other posts can also jump in. So it's sort of like how you're engaging your local government, which can be hard, but then maybe who else can leverage or has power over them and when you kind of bring them in to help nudge? Yeah? OK. I think I'm going to take the last one first. So essentially, um, we didn't involve the local, the international organizations at a very early on step, right? Our, our thought process was since we're part of the government, we want to show that this is a government-led initiative. We ourselves took the initiative. We're funding this thing because we, we, we want to make this a priority, okay? And it was not because some other, um, like, like UN or someone else, like another third party international organization asked us to do, or it was part of some resolution, but because we, we felt the need to, we, we, we saw that our, our women or our, our civilians were getting affected by this and we had to do something about it. So initially, the, in the design phase as well, we, we yes, we, we um, took input from the local civil society organizations, but once we had the idea ready, okay, once we had the stakeholders, all the stakeholders on board, and we, the project was in its implementation stage, that's when we started engaging with the national organization specifically, UN, Gays and Board, others even. And, and so then tell them, hey, this is what we're doing, um, and, and would love to get your thoughts on how, on how we can technically provide technical assistance, how to improve upon this, like how to improve upon the case or process, SOPs, so on and so forth as well. And then we never went um, to them with the ask of, hey, we want funding for this project, okay? Maybe like, so even our funding requests are mostly like, hey, we don't want money for like brick and mortar. Like how about you help us in like technical assistant, uh, assistance, so on and so forth, SOPs and, and, and those sort of things. So I think that helped because it's very important what your ask is with these international organizations, okay, and what you, and, and because we went with this with this um, phase devised approach, if you may call it, this is this trajectory, right? And um, I, I thought international organizations were also more an amenable to do receptive to the idea as well as like, hey, they're not asking for money. They're asking for how we can help improve. For example, okay, our case flow process, our SOPs were actually designed with the help of International Human Rights Law Clinic at U Chicago Law School. Okay, like okay, this is like a great project that they're doing. Like, how can we help to make sure that their um, leave procedures or rules and regulations are in line with international human rights law, so on and so forth as well. So, so that sort of thing. But now that we're in this <laughs> um, phase when we're have, like, we're struggling, sort of like struggling to um, uh, have this current administration, administration on board. I think that's where, be, because we had all these national organizations on board and, and, and earlier previously, they're helping us put some sort of pressure and like talk to the government officials and saying, hey, no, can, no, this should be like a, still be a priority of the new administration, okay? Because the type of impact that it's having on ground, like let alone the national discourse that it's changing, this whole Me Too era movement, okay? That we've seen the um, increase in reporting rate of such crimes, okay? So on and so forth. I know I'm taking really long. Um, just to finish this off. But the impacts, okay, we need to do something. And then in, in terms of like engaging the government officials, um, Yes, it can be hard, but I think I alluded to this initially. You, when you, you, when you're in a meeting with them, like one government department, they're like a four or five officials, okay, from top to bottom, okay, middle, it's actually. You, you can, you, in one meeting, you can sort of like gauge which person is more receptive to your idea based on the questions they're asking, or even like their tones, their hand gestures, their facial so on and so forth. And then even if the top person is like not really receptive, you sort of click with this middle ex mid executive person, okay? You talk to them separately away from their bosses and say, hey, this is what we're doing, okay? Are you like, and, and, and you know for a fact that these are the people who are actually gonna implement the project. The top level boss is just gonna like, 
I don't monitor and evaluate, so on and so forth. But these ground level, mid level forces, people are actually going to implement the idea, have work with you. So you take them on board. And like similar with other, like with like police, prosecution, all these other departments as well. And then, so the work's already, you're working with them, the work's already started. It's just like, then, then you use their help to sort of get the bosses approved, um, get the bosses on your side as well. Thank you. Um, I think if there's one thing that we've sort of heard as a theme throughout, um, when you want to design a meaningful project, at the heart of it is going to be building relationships. Um, building relationships at multiple levels with your constituents, with the folks you hope to reach, with government at many levels. You never know which bureaucrat will help you get it over the finish line. And then the folks who have power over those bureaucrats or power over the funding sources, um, because at any stage of that design project, you're going to need to leverage power and relationships to keep to your goal. So I would like to thank all of our panelists and certainly all of you and CGIU for this wonderful opportunity.